All right. So the topic today is of angels and devils is the title and the topic is Datura plants and trees. Um, we're actually going to be talking about Datura, the, the genus Datura, which includes um, sometimes kind of informally Datura trees, which are actually known by the name Brugmansia. So the two plants are Datura and Brugmansia. Okay. Sometimes they're called Datura trees and that's why I put those together. And then the title there of angels and devils is um, because sometimes these plants are known as angel trumpets, and sometimes they're known as hell's bells or devil's trumpets or something like that. And so it kind of plays off this idea that with a lot of these plants, sometimes your experience is a more positive experience, and sometimes it's a more challenging experience. And so that's kind of the dual nature there of the angels and the devils, right? Um, here. All right. So um, let's get right into this. In a previous um, uh, Kalmekak, we talked about the nightshade family itself. And the nightshade family, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but is, it is an extremely large family of plants that contains all kinds of extremely interesting and economically important plants to humans, things like chilies, things like potatoes and tomatoes and eggplants, all kinds of different plants, important plants to us, plants that we use for food, plants that we buy and sell, plants that we grow, etc. Other plants as well, like tobacco, okay, and so we can kind of see plants that have some kind of psychoactive effect to them, in this case, nicotine. Um, there are over 2,300 species, again, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers, tobaccos, but also belladonna, henbane, and mandrake. And those are plants that we talked about in our Hexing Herbs of Europe, Kalmekak. And we talked about how those plants have been used historically for all kinds of different things, whether it's something as simple as cosmetics. In other words, to increase the size of the pupil. That's one of the, the um, kind of one of the uh, side effects of these powerful plants or even psychedelic drugs in general, right, is, is, a, is a dilating effect on the pupil. And so we see that in, for example, um, the 1500s, that's what they were doing in, in Italy, is they were putting some henbane or some belladonna in the eye to make the pupil large because they thought it made a woman look pretty. And so you've got a woman like Mona Lisa, right, who has these large black eyes. And the reason is she probably has belladonna in her eyes and she's dilated her pupils. And so whether it's for something like cosmetics or whether it's for um, uh, a medicinal purpose, these plants, belladonna, henbane, and mandrake uh, have been used uh, during childbirth, during labor to, to numb the effects and the pains of childbirth, or whether it's used for sorcery. These are the classic witch's brew plants used to, um, to empower uh, yourself over someone else, okay? So we talked about those before. And in a lot of ways, our topics today, um, uh, Datura and Brugmansia are similar to these. They're in the same family and they have the same uh, active molecules, the same components. And so we'll talk a little bit of uh, that in a, in a bit here. And so Datura is our topic for today, which is a plant. And then the tree, essentially the tree, South American analog of the Datura, which is the Brugmansia, okay, which we'll also talk about today. So, um, possibly, yeah, po possibly there is some status to it. I think that uh, cosmetics and fashion uh, is always tied to some kind of status. Um, I don't know if it was expensive. I don't know what it would cost, but it definitely is a little bit dangerous. The Datura? The angel trumpet. Yeah. And so angel, here's uh, one difference is as far as I can tell, the angel's trumpet, the Datura and the Brugmansia aren't used or haven't been used for cosmetics. It's, uh, it's specifically the belladonna, which is the European uh, form, if you will, of this type of molecule. Belladonna in Italian means beautiful woman. And so that specifically is the plant that was used in Renaissance Europe uh, as a cosmetic to dilate the pupils. 
And as far as I can tell, it, uh, the deterrent in Brugmansia hasn't been used that way. It's been used for all kinds of other things that we'll get into, but not for uh, cosmetics. So the Datura genus consists of numerous species. Uh, the most important species for us today are Datura stramonium, Datura anoxia, and Datura metal. Those are definitely the most common, the most important species of Datura that have been used uh, in sacred contexts. All right. Now there are some others as well, but these three are by far the most important and the most common. And moving forward from now on, I'm just going to say Datura, and I'm going to kind of put all of these three species, even though they can be um, identified separately, and they're kind of, they have kind of different histories a little bit, and they have different kind of original um, native habitats. I'm just going to put them all together in one just for ease, okay? So moving forward, I'm just going to say Datura, or I'll use the local name, whether that's Toloache or whatever it is, um, to talk about these plants. Um, so Datura is, uh, let me go back to this one. Datura is a small bush or plant, one to two meters tall. It's an annual, which means it grows and lives for one year and then dies and, and uh, is, um, relies on propagation through seed distribution. It can grow a little bit taller as well. You might find it as tall as three meters uh, in height in the tropics. And in the tropics wh where it really prefers, it prefers a warmer climate, you'll find that it, it usually survives as a perennial, okay? Uh, Datura anoxia and the other Datura, Daturas have hairy leaves with serrated margins and white funnel-shaped flowers, which normally bloom at night. And so usually when it starts getting dark, these, these uh, flowers will open up. All right. And then often you can see them during the daytime kind of closed. And so they'll open up at night and they become more fragrant at night. Some people say the smell is a little bit obnoxious. It smells kind of like maybe old peanut butter. Sometimes in particular with the Brugmansia, the smell is much more pleasant. It's incredibly aromatic and beautiful and, re and fresh smelling. Okay. So um, the, the fruits are pendulous and covered with many short thorns. And this usually contributes to these plants being called thorn apples. That's one of the, the names. We're gonna see that these plants have, I don't know, 50 different names. They're just, they, they call them all, people have called them all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. And that's gonna be kind of some of the fun that we get into when we talk about ethnography is going to be the different names and why they have that name. Uh, the seeds are brown to orange in color and they're inside of the fruit, which is, as I said, small and covered in thorns. Um, the Brugmansia, you need to say anything about uh, Datura? Uh, you find them mainly, uh, this is one of the great things about Datura, not so much Brugmansia, but Datura is, this is the first plant we've talked about that's native to, South, to Southern California. And so, you know, you're not going to find probably magic mushrooms growing around Southern California. You probably aren't going to find peyote. You're not going to find any of these other plants that we've talked about so far, but you will see Datura. And if you look for it and you know what to look for, you'll see it all over the place. When I first learned of it, oh my gosh, I started seeing Datura everywhere. I was working at Cal State Fullerton and I was leaving the campus and getting on the freeway, and there was a gigantic Datura plant right next to the freeway. I said, yeah, that's a Datura, that's awesome. And so uh, see me, when I see a Datura plant in the wild, it's like unexpectedly seeing the rising full moon or spotting Venus for the first time in the night as the evening star. It's a magical experience. You got a road back there, just part of them from one end to the other, from one street to the other, just- Just covered, just uh, all along the way. Yeah, they really like um, kind of like vacant lots. They like kind of side, you know, like areas that are kind of by the side. You know, it's it's kind of it grows kind of like a weed, and so uh, quarter acres, half acres, so they love it. They love it. Yeah, you'll see them pop up, and um, you can uh, readily identify them by their kind of dark green leaves, and then obviously the white flowers popping up. And it's a beautiful plant. I really, really like it. All right, Brugmansia is a little bit different. And so Brugmansia is, um, is more of a, well, I guess we'll get to that uh, in a little bit here. I was gonna say it's more of a tropical plant, all right? 
Um, I guess uh, Datura is more of a subtropical plant. Uh, Brugmansia is, is the South American analog of the Datura. And it has the same or similar beautiful white uh, colored flowers that bloom in a similar fashion. I tend to see the Brugmansia with the flowers that came down and Datura often will have the flowers that go up, uh, which is slightly weird because the word in, in Mexican Spanish for Datura is Toloache, which comes from the Nahuatl Toloatzin, which means something like bowing head, which is odd because it seems that I've usually seen them pointing up. So that might be a, um, a reference to reverence as opposed to the drooping head of the flower. It would also be that over time, something has changed and it, it just develops their way because they say like, you know, 400 years, they were able to cultivate the thing. So maybe this is adapted in a different way once the, the colonizers take root. It could uh, very well be. That could be the case. And um, you second round? Yeah. Here, I got this for you. This is our president. This is our Tlatuani. Hi. This is our speaker. <laughs> yeah, I can't see long. I'm on the position of turning around, doing a bunch of things. All right. But I did want to stop. I did make the announcement in my art class today. Perfect. Be conscious. Perfect. Um, we'll touch base about that. Great. Excellent. We'll be in touch. All right. Good luck. She is always on the move. Um, I would say you mentioned possibly there's been a change. It could very well be. I don't know specifically, but one thing I do know in talking about changes uh, from kind of a more natural setting is that um, the way that this plant has been described is that it no longer lives or can no longer live wild. It, has, it is extinct in the wild. It is, it is now a fully cultivated plant and there are no examples of it, of, of, of it surviving in a wild habitat. And I think one of the, the speculations is that the um, potential animals that might have helped it reproduce have uh, lost their habitat. And because they've lost their habitat, the plant uh, has ceased to exist in the wild. And so, which is, is a bummer, right? It makes you feel sad. On the other hand, right? Because there's always two sides to a coin. On the other hand, we're the ones keeping it alive, you know? And that's a beautiful thought. That, in fact, it's as beautiful of a thought as, as it is a sad thought to say it doesn't exist in the wild anymore. And so I'm doing my best. This right here is a baby Brugmansia. And I've, I've got a number of uh, different plants that I've been growing. It's, in fact, these are my two, two of my plants. The, the, my, my beautiful ladies, I call them. Um, and so I'm doing my best uh, to, to keep these plants alive to keep them alive and to keep them going here in Southern California. It's hard with the cold weather. My, my mom has a tree that's especially huge. Though. It's huge? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it's still on the rid of it always. Oh, you know what you can do? The, the beauty of this plant is you can propagate it genetically. And so all you have to do is just cut it. Usually something that has a little bit of bark. You don't want it too green. You don't want it too fresh. But like this one right here, this is just a propagated, a propagated a stick. That's all I did. So you cut a branch, stick that branch in a bucket with water, let it set there for two weeks, three weeks, and it'll start to push out little yeah. tiny roots. Uh, you can, I didn't, but you can if you want to. It'll just start pushing them out. Anything that touches water will start to grow roots. And then once they get a little bit longer, you just put them in dirt. That's all I did. That's, that's what it was right there. And it grew this right here. That's all new. That's all fresh and it's split. Will we be allowed to put that information on campus? I would love to. Because we're, we're talking about the latest, you know, the, the white phase and stuff, and how well, we're, we're going to be implementing something with uh, maybe a town, uh, Yandia town people. Hopefully, you know, the casino might want to donate some money so we can get some native stuff in here. I think it'd be great. Um, like I said, it's, it's not native to California, but it is a plant that is, has been respected and loved uh, by indigenous people. And it, it has played a role in the culture, and it's beautiful, and it smells nice. I was about to say, just the same way, before the borders were here, they, you know, they could trade with it amongst themselves and stuff. Yeah. So you could propagate it. You just cut that, you just cut a missile on, okay. I'm get a and you can just grow a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah. They're hard to find. I, I couldn't find one at yeah. any nursery in California. I looked at probably five to six different nurseries. No one had it. I finally found 
a small local um, um, a nursery owned by this Mexican guy. And I, I, we were talking about sacred plants. And I said, you know what plant I'm lo really looking for? I'm looking for a brugmansia. And he says, I've got one of those. And he took me to the back, the, the far corner of his, of his nursery. And I said, oh my gosh, I haven't seen one of these. And, and I've, had, I've been looking for months, you know? And he says, uh, yeah, it's a powerful plant. He said, I have a bad heart. And uh, just being around this plant makes me feel weak. He says, I don't want it anymore. I'll sell it to you for 25 bucks. I, deal, done. I'm buying it right now. I took it home. I split it into three. These were, these were all together before. There's another one too. I split it into three and put them in three separate pots. And now I have these three beautiful plants. When you work with this plant, do you wear a face mask and gloves? Um, I, I don't wear a face mask. I wear gloves if I'm going to be doing lots of work with it. If I'm just picking off one dead leaf, I don't. Um, but if I'm having any extended contact with this, this plant, then I do because the tropane alkaloids in this plant are um, transdermal and they will go right through your skin. And so um, you don't want to handle them too much. Uh, you don't want to, you know, you want to be careful around ki with kids or, or animals because we'll see too much of this plant uh, can be fatal. And so um, this is, that's the Brugmansia here. And moving forward, uh, these are the different, the most important species. There are others, but these are the most important ones. The Arborea is the white. The Aurea is the gold, it's the beautiful gold color. And the Sanguinea is that beautiful pink and red color. And there are a couple of different ones. And they have different habitats and things like that. Let's talk a little bit about the Datura. This is actually a general Datura distribution. It's not just the Datura inoxia. But we'll see, like I said, this is a, an American plant, obviously, but it's localized and it's most common in the Southwest, Southwest of the United States and Northern Mexico. Um, and obviously it kind of extends down depending on the species. Um, the Stramonium is a little bit more Northern, the Anoxia is a little bit more Mexico, and the metal is a little bit more South America. Um, but that is the distribution, the natural habitat distribution for all the deterrents put together. And this is the, um, the transplanted distribution of the plant. And so it has been transplanted to much of the world, all of Africa, South America, Europe, and Asia, down in here in Austronesia, et cetera. Yeah, okay. Um, and then as far as the distribution goes for the Brugmansia, we'll see it's radically different. Right? Look at look at this. So this is the tree. And so it thrives in the Amazon, it thrives in warmer conditions, but you can even see it up in the Andes as well. And it only has limited and introduced um, habitat in these other areas, whether it's Africa or India or up into Mexico. And like I said, my plants took a hit recently over the last couple of months when it was real cold. They were they were suffering, and um, even in some places they recommend if it gets too cold to just overwinter them indoors, and so cut most of the leaves, and just throw them in your garage. They'll go dormant, and then bring them out when it gets a little bit warmer. That way, it'll prevent them from freezing, prevent them from you know from being shocked by the extreme cold. And so I don't know how you would make that work in a permanent location in the garden, but where there's a will, there's a way. You know, and, and plants, I've noticed that when, if plants want to survive, they'll survive, you know, and they'll adapt. So, all right. Um, okay, let's talk about the active molecules. And we talked a little bit about this when we were doing our hexing herbs of Europe. And so I would re refer you to um, that uh, lecture. It's on YouTube if you want. Just, uh, just go to YouTube and to do Club Sochipili. You'll see our website and all of our previous Kalmekak seminars are all up there. And I'll go, I go into a little bit more in depth of the molecule, how they affect the individual, et cetera. Today, I wanna to spend a little bit more time on ethnography, et cetera. But um, these molecules here, they're not really, you know, we talk about classic psychedelics, whether it's peyote or magic mushrooms or the tryptamines or whatever it is. And these are not those. These are not psychedelics. These are usually classified as deliriums. And the difference between a psychedelic and a deliriant is that a deliriant, when you take it, makes you 
kind of confused. It's confusing because you can't tell if the hallucinations you're having are real or not. And that's, that's a pretty powerful thing, right? You could go and you know take a whole bunch of Datura or take a whole bunch of Henbane or Belladonna or you know a, a whole bunch of Brugmansia, have a Brugmansia tea, and you could sit down in your living room and a friend of yours could come over to your house and sit down with you in your living room. You have a 30 minute conversation with him and he gets up and leaves. And then uh, turns out you talk to your friend later and he was never there. And you thought he was, you know, or you might smoke a cigarette that's not there. And you think it is. You know, you can find videos of this online where people are doing things where, where they're interacting with some other world and they don't even know it. And so that's kind of the traditional definition of delirium is that you don't know what's real and what's not. Whereas when you take a high dose of magic mushrooms or something, you know, you know, there's something coming, you know, there's a hallucination and you know, it's a hallucination, right? It doesn't make, doesn't make the experience any less extreme, but it does, there, there's some kind of comfort in Okay, I took a drug. It's going to be all right. If I can just hang on for five hours, I'll get through it. And with Datura, like there's no guarantee at all that you will be able to recognize anything. And that's kind of scary. Okay. And again, these are all transdermal. In fact, hyoscyamine scopolamine is used in motion sickness patches. That's the, that's the molecule, that's the active molecule that prevents you from feeling sick if you get on a boat. And it's in a patch. And so they're transdermal. And so I don't sit around, you know, rubbing my glands. <laughs> if I do, my, my wife might, might have a surprise. I might start talking to people. Who knows? Um, all right. So let's get into the ethnography. And this is, I think, where, where we really see some rich, some richness. Okay. And we're going to start with something um, kind of fun, kind of uh, maybe a good warning to us. We're going to talk about Jamestown and Jimson weed, right? one of the names for Datura. We're going to talk about Tolawache in Mexico and how it's used. The Tolawache cult sometimes is what it's called in Mexico. We're going to talk about the Chumash Indians, obviously here in Southern California, super important. Um, and we're going to talk about Pinwheel Cave. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah? All right. Um, I recently learned about this within the last year, and that is super cool. Okay. We're going to talk about Zuni mythology. And an origin story, we're going to talk about the Navajo in Chaco Canyon. We're going to talk about uh, some mythology tied to Datura there. And we're going to talk about Spirit Mountain, which is important. It's been in the news recently. And we're going to talk about the creation of the universe. And we're going to end up with a little bit of Brugmansia. Unfortunately, there's less ethnography about Brugmansia. I don't know why, but it seems to have been used less by indigenous peoples. And so um, it's almost half and half, half modern sorcery. And then half kind of, I don't even know. I want to say cheese mace. Like I haven't found any really good academic sources that deal with Brugmansia and how it's been used by indigenous peoples. Um, I have some, obviously, some lacunae in my studies and, and, and Brugmansia is one of them. It's my favorite plant to grow. It's my favorite plant to smell. It's my favorite plant to look at. And I have uh, probably, like I said, probably 15 of them in, in my garden at home. Uh, but I, I've never used it, I, I've, and, and I haven't studied it academically very much. You know, my knowledge of, of um, Teunanakat and magic mushrooms is off the chart. I don't know much about Brugmansia, and so moving forward, it's something I need to study a little bit more. So let's get right into the ethnography of it. And like I said, we're going to start with something that might be a little bit of a warning, okay? And it's something that's kind of cool. It also tells us, uh, gives us a reason for the name Jimson weed. So this is kind of a cautionary tale of how the plant can affect you if you don't have the necessary respect for it. It also explains the origin of the name Jimson weed. The story comes to us from the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia. And this has particular resonance for me because my ancestor, Richard Pace, this is my, on my mother's side, Richard Pace, my mother's last name was Pace, Richard Pace lived at Jamestown. He was there in 1620. He grew tobacco. Maybe that's why I love tobacco so much. Uh, I don't know. But he was there in um, Jamestown as early as 1620. 
And so maybe his children witnessed what happened 55 years later. All right. And this is what happened. Around 1675, a group of British soldiers were sent to the Virginia colony of Jamestown to pacify the troubles of Bacon's Rebellion. Foraging for food, these soldiers gathered detura leaves for a salad and ate plentifully of it. As the effects of the plant took hold, the troops seemed to slowly lose their mind and dissociate from reality. In 1705, Robert Beverly wrote of the incident. He said, for they turned natural fools on it for several days. One would blow up a feather in the air. Another would dart straws at it with much furt. And another, stark naked, was sitting up in a corner like a monkey, grinning and making mouths at them. A fourth would fondly kiss and paw his companions and sneer in their faces with a countenance more, more antic than any a Dutch droll. I don't know what a droll is, but it must be funny. In this frantic condition, they were confined, lest they should be in their folly, destroy themselves, though it was observed that all their actions were full of innocence and good nature. Indeed, they were not cleanly, they were not very cleanly, for they would have wallowed in their excrements if they had not been prevented. A thousand such simple tricks they played, and after 11 days returned to themselves again, not remembering anything that had passed. Hmm. Clearly, this is a plant that deserves our respect. And that's why we call this Jimson weed, Jimson from Jamestown. Okay. All right. In Mexico, Datura is commonly known as Toloache and has a long and extensive history of use by numerous indigenous tribes. The name Toloache comes from the Nahuatl word Toloatzin, which means bow the head, but also reverential. Okay. Clearly, this appellative is either a reference to the slightly inclined flowers, although, as I mentioned, I usually see them more vertical. Okay. So it's either a reference to the slightly inclined um, flowers or to the reverence we should have for the powerful spirit within. Historically, it is both magical and medicinal and is more often used in northern and western Mexico. Midwives commonly administer it during childbirth for its analgesic effects, as well as its capability to cloud the memory. Remember those British soldiers didn't remember what happened. They didn't even know. And you can see how that would be helpful for a woman in childbirth to not be able to remember the horrible pain and the travail that she went through. The, yeah, maybe even that as well. Yeah. For the Mexica, a woman giving birth was the equivalent of a soldier going to war. And her, for nine months, going down into the valley, into the valley of the underworld, to bring that soul to life, to this earth, was her battle. And if a woman died giving birth with her first child, she was given the same honors in the afterlife as a warrior that died on the battlefield. That's the equivalent of a Viking going to Valhalla. And I don't think the Vikings even had that. For a woman to go to Valhalla. And so um, a woman. Okay, okay. So unless they played a role in the war, yeah. For the Aztecs, war for a woman was childbirth, okay, was labor, was the labor, was the battle of bringing a, a, a soul into this world, okay. And so um, they used this in order to uh, allow them to help them through that difficult period of time. Uh, okay. Spiritual practitioners would also roll the leaves and smoke them or eat the seeds in order to enter shamanic realms of divination and attain knowledge otherwise inaccessible. For the Huichol tribe, are you guys familiar with the Huicholes? The Huicholes are from Western Mexico, kind of Northern Jalisco into like Aguascalientes, Nayarit in that area. So the- That pertains to like the blue smut on the corn or is that- uh, are you talking about the mold that grows on the corn that they eat? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the connection between those two is, but I do know that this this tribe is called the Weechels. In fact, they're the ones that produce this this uh, the yarn art. They're the ones that take peyote and they make art on their trips. They also do the chiquita, 
They do the small little beads and they decorate things with the different colored beads. Those are the huichols. So the huichols of, of Western Mexico, Tolawache is considered a bad plant of the gods and is seen as the counterpoint to their preferred sacred plant, peyote. They tell stories from their mythology of an ancient battle between the two plants with peyote, of course, ending up victorious. For them, the plant is a tool of malevolent sorcerers. On the other hand, for the famed long distance running Tarahumara tribe, have you heard of the Tarahumaras? Um, apparently, our, my great-great-grandmother was responsible for living in our family. Uh, they did in our that kind of family. Mm, interesting. Yeah, you've got a. In, and my grandmother was born in 1920. In oh, wow. The city of Chihuahua. And then during the revolution, her father came up into the El Paso. That's the interesting. That's so interesting. Believe it or not, my grandmother was born in Chihuahua right around the time of the Mexican Revolution. And they fled Mexico and they went to Arizona. Isn't that crazy? So it sounds like you have a history of some practitioners. Yeah, some sacred knowledge in there. And I would, as much as you can, try to make sure that you get as much as you can, pass it on. My son, as I was That's saying right. earlier. That's I right. My grandmother was born in 1925, and she came from a little village of North too. And, and yeah, a lot of the healing practices came through to my tia. And then she passed away on her. Like, if any of us were her, they, they don't know what it was. They could just put their hands like that. Yeah. They, they would throw stuff on alcohol all the time and then massage you. And yeah. You. Yeah, that knowledge is powerful, man, and sacred and special. And sometimes it's a gift that that doesn't get give that's not given to every single person. It's given to certain families, and a lot of times it's hereditary. And not it's not just oh, I'm going to teach you. There's something else there. There's something innate. And I just sit there and I'd be massaging her leg. And before when she got, couldn't walk and started feeling like she said, for whatever reason, like I would go like this. I, I don't even have any memories. Like I don't, this is what I was told. Mm. But she said that when I would put my hand over her leg and like, like I wasn't even going to church or nothing at the time. It was just something innate that she said that she felt like she could just walk. Like it was, it was weird. Yeah. Like what happened to that? Like I didn't keep going with it or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's weird, yeah. That, I didn't even, I just forgot about the memory for so long and mm. just kind of popped in my head right now. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> a lot of times it's it's like, a, like you said, it's still there, right? It's it's a gift. It's in there. And even if you don't practice it or develop it, it's still there. And at any point, it could be taken out, polished off, dusted off, and developed. Yeah. You know? That's beautiful. I really like that, guys. Um, let me, uh, real quick. Da, 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 da. Okay. So the Tarumaras, have you guys heard of the Tarumaras? Yeah, these are the, the long distance runners. So similar to the Weechols, kind of similar area, this kind of the same area that we're talking about, this Northern Mexico. Northern Mexico has some magic there, guys. All right. And so um, in particular, right, if we're looking at this map up, map up here, the Tihuatlos of the United de Mexico, this is the land of peyote. And so there's some magic up here. And with healing, right, with spiritual healing, with physical healing, same thing that you guys are talking about right here. And so the Tarahumaras, they would they they do their running with a peyote button tucked into their belt right, to give them strength in case they have pain. It'll help them alleviate their pain. And so this is a, a this is a tradition that has a, a lots of experience with sacred plants. So um, uh, for the Tarahumara, Tolawache is known as de Cuba, and it's used to fortify fermented maize drinks and to induce visions and ceremonies. In modern times, Tolowache is commonly found in love amulets. You could go to a mercado and maybe pick up a, a love potion, a love amulet, some, some love magic, right? Uh, this might be some sort of sympathetic magic, but the connection is more than just symbolic, I think. Because the plant induces delusions, it has the power to make you highly suggestible to the influence of other people. For, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, right? That's that's the whole magic and medicine dichotomy. 
So the effects of the plant are so well known that it's common in Mexico to tell someone that's, you know, head over heels in love with someone, right? You, you probably have felt that, or you've known someone that's just crazy for another person, their boyfriend or their girlfriend, their husband or their wife or whatever. In Mexico, it's common to say, te dieron toloachen. They gave you toloachen as a way to explain your possibly, right? Your, your, yeah, your craziness, your love crazed uh, a, 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 a affection for someone else. And so um, another type of love magic is when a wife suspects her husband has been cheating. She might dose her husband, right? The power of the Mexican mom, the Mexican wife, the power in the kitchen, right? This is the like water for chocolate. This is the magic that comes through in the kitchen, right? She's in charge of making sure people are healthy. She's the custodian of the food. She decides what goes in it, right? And so uh, she has the ability often to surreptitiously maybe dose her husband. Let's find out if he's been cheating. We'll give him some tolawache. Yeah, give him some tolawache. He becomes highly suggestible. He doesn't realize what he's doing. And she starts asking about the sancha, right? Orale, I know. So, yeah, yep, yeah, MK Ultra. They were studying LSD, magic mushrooms, but they were also studying the turf. I mean, that's way more than LSD or magic mushrooms. That sounds like a truth serum. Yep, yeah, and they were doing this for for you know for spies. And, you know, they're worried about North Korea. They're worried about what they were doing to our soldiers. And they were trying to figure it out. Now, often when people talk about MKUltra, they talk about magic mushrooms or they talk about LSD. They don't talk about Datura very much, but I think that's the truth, sir. No, I don't know. Um, so this is cool. So you said that you're familiar with Pinwheel Cave. Um, it's located right here in Southern California, kind of in between Santa Barbara and Bakersfield. So it's right there, kind of in the foothills. On this side, on, on the Central Valley side of that mountain, that coastal mountain range. So Datura is one of the most sacred and powerful plants of the American Southwest. And most of the tribes in the area have some type of traditional use of the plant. For the Chumash, it was commonly used during puberty initiation rites. At least that was maybe the first introduction to the plant for a member of, um, of the Chumash. This type of liminal ritual marked the transition from youth to adulthood. Young men and women might take the plant in a number of different ways, possibly alone, away from the tribe in a secret or secret location, be it a cave or a mountaintop, or they might take it in the company of a holy man or holy woman. The consumption of the plant might be occasioned with fasting or other spiritual preparation. Right, the moment in in our society, these kind of coming of age moments are losing their importance. We don't have as many of them. You know, maybe graduation from high school, maybe getting your driver's license, maybe turning eighteen, maybe turning twenty-one. You can finally drink, but they don't have the same role that they did for some of these other cultures, where there's a clear a clear transition from youth to adult responsibility. So we just aim to see just don't have that I think and I think it's I think I think we're going to regret it I think we're going to regret not not helping our kids become adults you know adults so to like my kids I know <laughs> like, you know you're going to be an adult you're 30 <laughs> yeah yeah and this was happening around puberty for for these people you know we're talking maybe 10 11 12 13 what not was the what? Maybe, you know, it kind of depends. It kind of depends on lots of different things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, amongst the Aztec, for example, there are accounts of kings living till their 90s. You know, so maybe the average was 30, but that's because we've got kids that didn't survive birth, you know. But it's not like everyone died at 30, you know. And so there are accounts of people living to exceedingly old age. And you're right. They were the custodians on the knowledge, man. Um, so uh, the resulting altered states of consciousness might be marked by deep realizations of the role they should play within the larger group. 
Or maybe they might have a revelation or a connection with a spirit animal or possibly an ancestor. It also, it's also possible that they had a vision of their own unique purpose and the path they should follow in this life, whether it's to be a holy man, whether it's to be a healer, whether it's to be a provider, a hunter, a warrior, etc. After this initiation ceremony, the Torah could be taken for any number of other reasons, including to gain spiritual power, to counter black magic, to ward off ghosts, to divine the future or to, or to find lost objects. Most especially, it could be used as a medicine for numerous physical ailments. The Torah could be consumed in several ways. You can drink it in an infusion, sometimes called a decoction. You could roast the roots. You could eat the flowers or the seeds. You can apply it as a poultice on wounds. Remember, it's transdermal. Or, or sometimes you could simply chew the roots or any other part of the plant. Every single part of this plant contains the scopolamine, the atropine, and the hyoscyamine. That is the leaves, the stems, the flowers, the roots, everything. It's chock full of this stuff. Isn't that the same potency across the board? Is it not the same what now? The potency is not the same across the um, that's you're talking about potency that's one of the big difficulties with this plant is it's tough to know how potent it is and you have it, yeah all those things plus the time of the year the season time of the day how old the plant is how fresh the plant is i mean it's amazing to think of how experienced you have to be with this plant in order to use it successfully. Yeah. Yep. And if you mess up, it could be fatal. And so, and, and those, that information, I haven't found it. Everything that I've ever read says you have to be careful with this plant. Oh. You don't know how strong it is. This plant could be super strong. This plant could be weak. And are you going to risk it? And I never risk it. <laughs> it's like, I'm no, sh I'm no shaman, but they say there are bold shamans and there are old shamans. There are no bold and old shamans. <laughs> Because the bold ones are just, let's see what happens. Boom, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Hey, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, in Chumash mythology, the plant was a prominent supernatural grandmother called Momoi. In recent years, an extraordinary discovery has been made in, at an anthropological site in the California foothills between Santa Barbara and Bakersfield. The location is known as Pinwheel Cave for the painting of a five-pointed pinwheel shape in the ceiling of the cave. It's right there. So this is obviously a Datura plant because if you've seen those flowers blooming, right, they, they, they start with the little pods and then they push out of the pod and they get real long and they're, they're all rolled up like an umbrella. And they're in a spiral shape with five leaves. One, two, three, four, five. And so these are the five, one, two, three, four, five. And it's in the spiral and it's closed because if it weren't closed, this would be open. So that is the, the, that is the flower of a Datura plant starting to open up, painted on the ceiling of this, of this cave at least 400 years ago. So recent analysis of plant quids, you guys know what a quid is? Quid is like a, it's like a, a wad of tobacco, right? That's a quid. It's it's a it's a chunk of plant material that you stick in your mouth and you chew and you suck on. And when you're done, you throw it or you stick it somewhere. And so what they did is they went in here in this in this in the ceiling of this cave and they found all these plant quids, balls of chewed leaves that someone stuck into the cracks of this cave with the Datura painting in the ceiling. And they did scientific analysis of those leaves and they determined that was the term. And so this is the first time ever that we have in the history of anything that we have a direct connection between cave rock art and the hallucinogenic plant that was used 
probably in the in in the area. Okay, we've we've people have been speculating about this connection for fifty years, sixty years, seventy years, and they haven't found any direct evidence. This is the first direct evidence. They just published this article about three years ago. Are there any carbon dating, or did they extract any DNA from those? I don't know if they extracted DNA, but I do think they dated it. I think uh, to four hundred years ago, so it'd be the, the sixteen, the early sixteen hundreds. Yeah, so early uh, colonial times, and in California, sixteen hundreds, there would there would have been almost no Spanish presence here at all, because the Spanish started pushing in in the seventeen hundreds when they started putting in their putting in all their missions. And so the land was claimed, right? The, the Spanish, the Spain claimed it. They they went into San Diego and their ships. They went into San Francisco and their ships. They claimed it, but they hadn't really settled in here. So this is, this is old, old, practically pre-contact use. Yeah, man, it's just incredible. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the Zuni. For the Zuni people of modern Western New Mexico, the Datura plant is extremely sacred and used for magical and medicinal purposes. Zuni holy men consumed it to become seers, people that could see the future, people that could see the past, people that could transcend the bounds of this universe in space and time. Doctors administered the root to patients to render them unconscious and perform simple operations like setting broken bones, treating dislocations, or making incisions to remove pus and the like. For the Zuni, the plant has a sacred origin steeped in mythology. They tell that in the olden days, a brother and sister, and I'm going to try to get these names right here, a neglakia is one, is the boy, is the brother, and his sister, Aneglak Yatsitsa, is the sister, all right, lived in the, I'm going to call them brother and sister, because my Zuni is not very well developed. <laughs> Ask me to pronounce an Arabic word, inshallah, I'll do it right, okay. Um, so um, they lived in the underworld. They were smart and curious and enjoyed making trips to the outer world where people are, to observe and learn about the plants and the animals of creation. After their trips, they would return to their mother and tell her everything they saw and learned. But the divine twins of the sun god grew suspicious of the overly inquisitive siblings and what they shared with their mother. One day, the divine twins stopped the brother and sister and interrogated them. The brother and sister told the divine twins that they had learned the power to make people sleep or to walk around or to see ghosts or to allow people to see lost or stolen items or to identify criminals that had stolen their personal property. Upon hearing this, the divine twins concluded that the brother and sister definitely had too much power and decided to banish them from the earth forever. In the very spot, that the brother and sister last step, stepped foot on the earth, the Tura flowers sprung up with the very same power as the inquisitive brother and sister, the power to make people, to make humans sleep, the power to make them walk around, right? Aimlessly, possibly, to give them the power to see where your lost or stolen items are, to give you the power to know who has committed a crime against you. Really a, a, a yeah, that, that I mean, to, to put it into kind of modern, modern terminology, that is, is, is one of the ways that modern humans are trying to understand that, that idea is to, is for the, the power of the mind, the mind's eye or the spirit to, to, break past the, ba the boundaries of the body and to access knowledge that you can't get in your body. I mean, imagine if you had that power, what you could do, you could do anything. That is the power to know what Vladimir Putin is doing in his office right now. That's the power to know what the Chinese think about our president. That's the power to know what the stock market is gonna do tomorrow. That's the power to do anything and have any power and have any amount of wealth. That's that's the philosopher's stone of the of the alchemists. 
And, and if we refer back to the Zuni myth, right, that the gods, the more powerful divine twins said, that's too much power for humans to have. We're going to banish you to the underworld. And so I imagine it was a cautionary tale that practitioners or parents would tell their, their kids, listen, this is a powerful plant. You need to make sure that you use it right. And if you aren't able to use this right, you shouldn't use it. I think that's a good word of wisdom for all of us with all of these plants that, that we study in Kalmekar. So uh, from that spot, the spot that the brother and sister went into the underworld, the sacred flowers spread out over the earth. This is something we haven't talked too much about, but Datura is mainly white, but you'll see Datura with shades of color sometimes. And so the idea here is that sometimes you'll see Datura with yellow, the yellow shades of blooms, or sometimes with blue, or sometimes with a faint red, or sometimes pure white. And guess what those four colors represent? The four directions of the, com of the compass. Those are the four sacred colors of the four of the four sacred directions of the compass. The four races, the four directions, all mm -hmm. Or even when you look at like you said the compass and how there's the swastika, I just read about that and they they point to certain uh um relations in the in the sky, right? You see certain star maps. Like, oh interesting. I mean there's yeah. right? they they or no, that's I'm thinking of the whole thing, right? Now. That's you mentioned swastika, and, and often people say, ooh, swastika Nazis, but hey, that's 1930s, right? And that symbol, that, that powerful symbol predates the Nazis by thousands of years. It's all around the world. All around the world, those four sacred directions. Yeah, and it usually, right, it used to be a symbol of, of peace, of friendship, of goodness, and then look what an evil man did. He turned a symbol into a symbol of wickedness. I was trying to think exactly about how mine took the whole thing. And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's like you gave them that power and you give it that way. I agree 100%. You know, Christians have a similar problem with the snake, with the serpent. A symbol that originally is a symbol of re regeneration, of resurrection, of renewal. I mean, I used to have serpents as, as pets as a child, and you could see them, their eyes get cloudy when they're ready to shed, and then they shed their skin, and they're fresh and clean and new, and they grow. That's the only way for a snake to grow, is to shed its skin. Oh, oh cool. All right. These, <laughs> yeah, these symbols, right? They're powerful. And if they're used, they can be used for, for good, they can be used for evil. And we need, I, I like your approach, and we need to take them back. We, can, we, we shouldn't give them power to let them co-opt these important symbols. All right, among the Navajo, let's talk about the Navajo here. We're at Chaco Canyon. You guys are familiar with Chaco Canyon? Uh, but we did go to the port. Of oh, to be able to get in. And, and it, it was closed. Wow. Um, but we did also pass the Chaco Canyon, which is south of the 85, I think, uh, as you're going into the northern part of uh, New Mexico. That part it is so incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's so beautiful. Mesa Verde, the Cliff House, that whole area, the whole Four Corners area is just God's country. It's beautiful. So among the Navajo, Detour is known as Crazy Maker but also beauty way decoction, all right? So again, this dual designation, this dialectic, this idea of good and bad together depends on how you use it and what you use it for. That's one of, these, uh, one of the ideas we've been developing in Kalmekak is, is that this is power and power isn't good and power isn't bad. It depends on how you use the power. You can use power for good, you can use it for bad. Okay. And so this idea, this kind of two names that, that represent kind of the good and the bad, the yin and the yang, the, the balance, right? The omiteo, the, the, the male and the female, the duality, right? Ah. Yeah, excellent. 
Uh, as a medicine, datura was used as a poultice for arthritic pain or, mu or muscle soreness and smudged or smoked to alleviate bronchial spasms of asthma and make breathing easier or to treat a running nose. As a magical plant, Navajo take small amounts of datura to protect themselves from the attacks of dark sorcerers and utilize the plant in divination and love magic. The Navajo Ahili ceremony is one, uh, is one in which the practitioner is transformed into the Datura spirit and is able to gain power over women he desires and game he wishes to hunt. The ritual is also used to heal individuals who are suffering from sexual excess and women who have been forced into prostitution. An old Navajo saying gives us insight into the variable potency uh, and the effects that dosage has. Their saying is, eat a little and go to sleep. Eat some more and have a dream. Eat some more and don't wake up. Okay, this idea again of potency, not knowing how much to take and how as, as you take more, the effects are radically different. The potent magic of Datura is apparent in the Navajo myth of the big gambler. And if we have time here, it's 5.30 already. You guys want to listen to this? If not, I can make this available to you. It's about five minutes. All right, let's, let's take a listen. Skip the verification. So this is the Navajo Memory Project. And uh, here we have uh, an account of the sacred, of the, um, the gambler, the myth of the gambler at Chaco Canyon. When the big gambler, when he first showed up at Chaco Canyon, he started inviting all the, the Navajos and the locals that live in, in that valley. And one of the things that he did was when he invited them over for food, for dinner, he would take the seeds of the Tura and he would pulverize the seed. And that seed, pulverized seed, he would include that in with the food that he prepared for the people that were going to show up. So when these people showed up and he fed them, all these people go into this intoxicated state. So when they're not in their, when they weren't in their right state of mind, when they were, weren't thinking correctly, the gambler took advantage of them. He started playing all these games with them. And so because they were intoxicated and they weren't in the right state of mind, they ended up losing all these games. And so they ended up losing their, their possession. Like their jewelry, their clothes, next thing, their, their bodies, their lives, their souls. So they became prisoners of the big gambler. And so uh, they started building all these buildings for them, like the, you know, the Uno Vida and uh, Pueblo Benito, Petro Kettle, and, you know, like, uh, you know, all these different uh, uh, rooms that, were, that, that are out there in the valley. So these uh, slaves were the ones that built these, uh, these structures for him. Initially, the reason why it came down was within that valley, the, there was a, what they call the salt can, the salt people of the Navajo that used to live there. They created a really nice turquoise disc. And so the sun, what we see here, the sun, he wanted that disc. And so he sent down one of his older sons to, to, as a gambler to win that disc from the people. And so when he tricked the people using the Tura, he ended up winning that disc. So instead of giving that disc to his father, like, like the way he promised, he decided to keep it, try to become the ruler there. And so over time, his younger brother, the big gambler's younger brother, was sent down from, uh, from another area. And he was trained by all these holy people. He was trained in all the different games of gambling. And they were trying to figure out how uh, he was going about winning everybody, like every game, you know, what trick he was using. So what they did is they decided to say, all right, let's go see uh, what he's doing to win all these games. And so one of the things that they that they did was they they they, they want to to send in some some flies and some some insects into the quarters of the big gambler, and they they wanted these uh, insects to act as uh, like spies to listen in on, on on what he's saying at night. So then they thought about it. Then they said, oh, we can't do that because. The gambler will know that we sent these insects because he keeps his place very clean, you know. There's no 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 insect spider or anything in, in these quarters. And then they said, all right, let's try uh the wind. Let's see if we can ask the wind people to go in there and find out these secrets. So the problem with the wind is it, it announces itself. When it, when the weird wind arrives, you see it's feel it swirling around you and you kind of hear it sometimes. 
So because of that, they said, no, the wind is not a good idea. They're going to find out that we send them. And then Sony finally, they, they settled in on, said, all right, let's go send in darkness. Because darkness will come in and descend in on a room in a location without any noise, you know. It'll, you know, uh, consume everything. So when they sent in darkness, darkness was listening in. And darkness found out that the big gambler was using the turret to win all his games. So what they did is they 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 tricked him, and then they had him consume the turret. And when he consumed the turret, he was under that state where he wasn't thinking right anymore. And then after they they start winning him, they say they start beating him at different gambling games, and they finally defeated him. So when they defeated him, they captured him. And they, they sent him up to the full moon. And then later on, another deity by the name Beyotidi, which is the predecessor, the Christian god, he had blonde hair and blue eyes. He made new land and new people for him, sent him back down to Mexico. And so that's that's where he became known as uh, Quetzalcoatl. So this plant here was was responsible for all that, what, what happened in Chapel Canyon of, of how the people lost all their all their gambling games because of being in this intoxicated state, you know. So the turo, like I said, is a very powerful plant that we have to respect, that we can't just handle uh, manually or get sniff the flowers. All right, I think again, a really good representation. Let's see if I can get out of that. <clears throat> How much we're connected, even our stories go back together and it's like without borders, right? Like you right. Say, went back yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, that was new to me too. I mean, I, I'm just recently I've been learning about the connections between Mesoamerica and Mes and Chaco Canyon and the trade routes, right? Bring in precious birds up there, chocolate, drinking vessels. I mean, there's a there's an incredible uh, mobility of ideas and we're, products. We're all stuck on the Silk Road over there, right? and Asia and everything, and all of this, but we don't even know what, what what's happening on our own. I know we've got we've got paths that are fifteen thousand years old that go from Alaska all the way down to South America. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a shame that, for example, when I was growing up, you know, we learned about uh, the Romans and we learned about the Greeks. And then I didn't know anything about Mesoamerica. I didn't know what was going on. I mean, they talked about, okay, people up here were hunting, you know, buffalo and they're hunting bison and yeah, a little bit, but I mean, we didn't get into the science. We didn't get into the mythology. We didn't get into the history. We didn't get into all the richness, all the richness of the culture. And what a shame. Um, I really appreciate what, he, what he's talking about there is its power. It needs to be used for good. You can, you can abuse it, right? This is the principle of power that applies to everyone. You can abuse it. Or you can use it for good, you know. And this guy was abusing it, empowering himself over people to to get gain. And from what I could tell, the people in pre-Columbia America, in particular in what is today the United States, do not like social classes and people abusing other people and getting gain and having power over them. Whenever that happens, they rise up and say, "No, sir, we're not going to do this." Whether it's in Chaco Canyon or whether you know where, or whether it's in Teotihuacan or wherever it is, it's people. The people on this continent are fiercely independent and and won't put up for anyone abusing them with with power. Um, let's see. Okay. Last, I think this is almost one of our last ones here. Real quick, this is a short one. So just ten days ago, guys, President Biden designated Avi Kwame or Spirit Mountain in Southern Nevada as a national monument, ensuring that the land around this sacred area will be protected in the future. This mountain holds significance for many First Nations peoples, in particular the Yuman tribes, as they considered it the site of creation. On some occasions, individuals would climb the mountain, consume Datura, and witness the creation of the universe. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be in such a sacred place under certain special circumstances, witnessing the creation of the universe. Um, in fact, I was going to go climb this mountain before I even realized how important it was. I don't even know if I deserve to go there and climb it now. 
Even if they have that tool, they can do that. They can do it. You know, they can do it. Mm. I think it would be a powerful experience. Sound of fire? I didn't realize what it was. I just said no. Nevada. Okay. I'd like to go out for the uh -huh. um, No, I haven't been there. You're talking right outside of Las Vegas? Las Vegas, then, you know, the 15, and then you have Lake Mead. And yeah. In between that is the Valley of Fire. It's You can be in your car or people hide, whatever. And um, the the style of the rocks, uh, it's it's that get an opportunity to this uh, valley of fire. Um, but I was in this time around. I was in um, which Charleston Mountain. I had right. idea that there it goes up to uh, eleven thousand square feet. Yeah, it snows square, up there. Yeah, and that it was snowing up there. It was it was awesome. It's like 40, 30 minutes below. We were at sixty. We we're up there and it dropped to, I think it was uh, 29. Oh, so man. Great. That's great. You go back one here. Yeah, this is uh, on the map. You'll see it as Spirit Mountain. It's right around Laughlin. So it's southern Nevada, southern Clark County, Nevada. It's kind of close to the Colorado River right there in the border of California, Arizona and, and Nevada. And on the map, it says Spirit Mountain. But I think the, the actual name is Avikwa Ame, which means something like the tallest mountain. And so that's, I think Avikwa Ame is the name of the official designation of the, um, I think it's a national a protected, national protected, uh, I don't know what the official name is. Go before you get to 100 and something, right? I know, I know. It's a national monument. And so the national monument is Avikwa Ame. Is it on... Um... A res uh, on a reservation. I, I don't think it's on a reservation. I think it's right between two other national monuments. I think Mojave is right there close. And I think the other one is, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm less familiar with this area, but I've been meaning to get out there. I mean, you know, you think of the desert as being harsh and difficult and dangerous place, but there is a stark beauty of the desert that is really compelling, I think. Yeah, you're right. I think that about the desert too. And, um, nice. There's something about it. There's there's a life there that is. One of the things I love about it. It's so like if you go to Bishop and then you go up into the mountains up in that area. Uh, talk about the Milky Way, oh. Rock Creek Lake. When you go up to nine thousand feet, um, it, it's beautiful. And then I'll just take the 395, take it all the way up. Oh, and, uh, north of Bishop, Tom's place, and then head up into the mountains. It's, it's I, great. I think uh, when I look up at the sky, I can't help but think this is like looking into the creator's timepiece. It's like looking in the back of a of a finely designed watch, you know, and seeing the 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 rotations. And the movement of celestial bodies is something that that speaks to me in a way that I can't even. The what? Oh yeah, I love all of those things. It's there's something that's so spiritual about it. Um, okay, we got uh, one more thing. It's this is a real short one too. Well, this is our last one. So, um, well, almost our last one. In South America, the Brugmansia tree, even focusing on Dutura a lot, like I said, there's kind of a paucity of information about Brugmansia, but I've got a few things for you. So in South America, the Brugmansia tree is known as borrachero, or maybe drunken tree, or, or tree of drunkenness, or something like that. It said that you should never fall asleep under a Brugmansia tree, because the flowers will drip nectar and the nectar will, will be infused with hyoscyamine and scopolamine and atropine. And if that gets on you, if you're sleeping under there for a couple of hours and you get a whole bunch of flowers, I mean, look at this. These things, literally, if you touch these, my, my plants, when I touch them, they will just drip um, all over the place. You know, So they say you're not supposed to ever fall asleep under a Brugmansia tree because um, the, that drug-filled liquid will drip all over you and, and you'll feel it. It'll soak into your skin and it'll affect you. In indigenous societies, it was supposedly used to drug the household of a king when he died. The inebriated members of the king's court, that would be his wives, 
possibly his children, possibly his servants, anyone that had allegiance or fealty to the king, right? The inebriated members of the king's court would willingly submit to being buried alive and would therefore pose no threat to the new king and his court. It sounds pretty horrible to us today, but remember, this is these are different people at different times of different culture. Yeah, and so we always need to remember there's a cultural component here and a historical component that we need to always keep in mind. In modern times, the tree is tied to malicious sorcery. There are accounts of prostitutes dosing their johns with Brugmansia extract in order to rob them. In a highly inebriated state, the extremely suggestible victim becomes a willing participant in the robbery. In one case, the victim unwittingly helped the perpetrator empty his apartment of his valuables and his bank account of his money. After the crime, the victim asked the doorman of his, uh, of his building, hey, why did you allow this to happen? The doorman responded, you were there doing it all. Why would I have stopped you? You were given permission for them to do it, right? And so you're so out of your mind, you can't tell what's real. It's a delirium. You don't know what's real and what's fake. You're highly suggestible. This is the truth serum, right? You'll just do what people tell you to do. Oh, give me your ATM card. Perfect. Now, what's your PIN number? Perfect. Thank you very much. Help me put your computer in my car. Okay. But this isn't a one-way street, guys. There are also accounts of men using Brugmansia to drug women uh, in order to take advantage of them. And so, again, the idea here is this is power. It might not be money. It might not be a firearm. You know, it's not a big, fast car. It's natural power, but that doesn't mean it's any less powerful. It's a principle of power. And we, I think, as humans need to learn to be wise with our power so that we can get more power so that we can do good things because good things can be done with power. And the only way to get more power to do more good things is to be wise and good with the power that we have. Um, that's it for, uh, well, let's see. I got one more thing here. I don't know if we should even listen to it. It's Ter you guys familiar with Terrence McKenna? Terrence McKenna is kind of like, a, he's like kind of like a new age, not really new age. I would say he's kind of a more modern philosopher, lecturer, author, psychonaut. He has done some extremely valuable work in, in getting the message out about these powerful plants. And so he's a little bit crass. He's he's a little bit uh, he's a little bit fun. he's kind of a trickster. If you're familiar with the trickster, you know he's kind of a trickster. Um, but he also is some of my early exposure to uh, to these plants was through Ter Terence McKenna. And here he talks about a deterrent trip and some experimentation that he had. And I think it's only about four minutes or so. I think it's worth listening to if you don't mind. And then I'll you know entertain any comments or questions or anything. Datura is a horse of a different color. Um, uh, I don't consider it a true hallucinogen. I would classify it as a delirium. Uh, I know that it's very big and magic, and I, and I understand why, because it's a confusant, and magic depends on confusion. Even stage magic depends on a certain confusion. You're looking in the wrong place and so forth. And uh, what Datura does, it, it's very hard to keep control of it. It erodes the core processes of the self so that you lose track of who you are, where you are, what exactly has happened. Uh, I took a, I took Datura several times in Nepal and had very strange experiences. I mean, they're not like other psychedelic experiences. I remember sitting in my little room in Bodenov on the third floor, and I had an open window. I was sitting there alone, waiting for the stuff to come on, and then my mind would wander, and I would think, it's not working. And then I would kind of lose attention, and these literally ghost-like forms, wraiths, would come floating in my window like in a cartoon, and they were carrying large sheets of newsprint. And they would release this newsprint and it would flutter down across them and like land across my lap. 
and I would fall forward and be reading these stories. And, and as I read, I would realize this is it. This is the answer. This is the and I would like pull out of it. And then I say, oh, it's not working. It's not working. And then go back into this weird place. Well, that went on for about a half an hour. And but then a more, in fact, this is what I referred to this morning when I said I've had many experiences where I was glad nobody else was there because I felt they would become alarmed and then create a brohaha. And what happened in these Nepali experiences is I was then really slowly became aware something was going on. So I'm sitting there waiting for the thing to hit. Suddenly I lift my leg up and throw it behind my back and then the other one and then put my arm through and I'm there in this totally spazzed out, knotted position. I say, hmm, this is weird. Very carefully unfold, unfold, lay down, breathe deeply, and then it would happen all over again. Boy, I'm glad nobody else is here. This went on for hours, and I just felt, you know, it's telling me I'm not for it. They say, you know, these things choose you, and and it was it was clearly uh, it was clearly not for me. But then I observed other people, and they didn't seem to be handling it too well either. A couple of days later, I was in the market buying tomatoes, and I met this guy. And I said, I had this detour trip from cheese. I don't know. And he said, Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm experimenting with it too. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm stoned right now. I said, Oh, really? Well, you seem to be handling all right. And then the conversation proceeded a little more. And then he made a remark that clued me to the fact that he thought we were in his apartment. <laughs> And, and so then I, I felt, uh, you know, this is weird, this is terrible, you know, we're, re we're losing hold of it completely, I don't know whether, you know, we're Agnes or Angus or it's day or night. Oh, that's it. Um, so that's all I have for you guys. If you guys have any comments, I'd love to hear it. Uh, or any questions about anything that I've said or shared with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before uh, the computer, there was something that popped in my mind about uh, how I watched the world, the light, and you got all the doors on. And, and you know, as far as that, the world, the light, there was, there was this kind of thing where they, they went out and they came, you know, to the earth, and they went and they went to it, and then they came out, and 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 they San Francisco is it? Where they drop the LED on them and they let the town go crazy and they basically they burn it, burn the town down. Or the town, or what happened there? Uh, I, I, I'm not familiar with that one. I have heard some. Experimental one and where they had the students in the, in the in a controlled environment and then they had that one, but we have. Oh, there's one where they said that they, they, they sat around the town to see the effect and they would just put in the water to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know there, I know one time it, it happened in France, I think, where, yeah, um, but definitely there, there's some governments have a lot of power and sometimes they do things that they shouldn't do. And, and we have records of them doing things they shouldn't do, even with their own citizens. And sometimes they they are look the CIA go ahead okay okay he was he was doing it all hiding all of the bad guys right okay well just locate them I mean if you can pick uh with the drone you know with the drone thing or whatever that is just <laughs> yeah, yep. And sometimes, you know, I think that that techniques and knowledge is getting so sophisticated that they might not even have to take a medicine. They can just do it through messaging, do it through psychological well, means. Right. Right. 
Yeah, no, I mean, they were studying it for 20, 25 years or something like that. And they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, no, they, they, uh, they told us, okay, on these schedule one narcotics, you know, we're not allowed to touch it because, you know, this and that. Who's to say that's just to uh, cover, right? They should be learning about all this stuff without anybody knowing. Definitely. I'm going to pause this and.